Uh, glad to be back with you again today. Uh, Randy Blunt here again. I have Jason, Jason Schroeder with me. Um, he is going to talk to us today about project engineering, field engineering. I think to get started, we, we go with field engineering. I mean, that's yeah. kind of for most people the first step to that uh, you know introduction from college or even maybe that first step, hey, I, I was an operator, a laborer. That's kind of that one of those first steps to get to um, to a management role. Yeah, I, I think that's it's a good part. It's funny that you mentioned that because project engineering is a term that most people are familiar with, right? Yeah. And if somebody said, you know, I want to be a project engineer, everyone in construction knows that, but field engineering only one out of seven people or <laughs> one out of five people would know what we're talking about, right? Yeah. So I think from an advertising standpoint, it makes zero sense to start there, but from a this is where we start standpoint. I like that because your mission is to, if I understand it correctly, is to elevate the, well, that's funny, elevate, yeah. right? To, to make the dirt world a better place. To make the dirt world a, a better place, which is, <laughs> which is which kind is, of which elevate. Is, yeah, just but, elevate. It's close. Yeah. Uh, you were, I don't, we'll see who was first, but I think we'll both <laughs> do it together. Um, field engineering, I think, is going to make the biggest difference for us. I'll, I'll tell you why. The the transition from being a foreman or a college graduate in my opinion really goes well through that field engineering standpoint and it's not you you and i had talked about in the, in the survey world you with your machines right you're linked into gps uh, whether you're horizontal or vertical people are using robotic total stations yep. this is no insult to the dirt world your tolerances are a lot larger than vertical construction yep. right yep you can get something you know, a couple t tenths in the wrong, or maybe not wrong spot, but you, ha you have more tolerance, right? Yep. So we're not talking about pulling chains and turning 90s and things yeah. like that. But the one thing that I'm noticing in it, from an industry standpoint is that we have these superintendents, these project managers who are, who you and the industry expects to be really solid builders. Yep. And so the question that, I, that I've asked, had to have been forced to ask and then the realization I've had is that they have to have a builder experience. And so I, I, uh, I, I will say that being a project manager and a superintendent, and I hope I don't bother anybody on the other side of the camera, is, is not a builder experience. It's a leader, planner, manager experience. Even if we're telling people to do things or interpreting plans or something, it's not a builder experience. I think yeah. you and I would agree that we spend, uh, you as a leader, when you're in the field or when you're managing or as a superintendent, we spend most of our time planning and executing work, communicating and dealing with people, looking at finances and making sure we have positive cash flow, right? We're not out measuring things. And so the position of field engineer gives somebody that one year, two year, three year, four years amount of time to piece things together. And so I promise I won't ramble on too long here, but if we, it allows people to think in a coordinate geometry system, right? So they're right out of school, they know the concepts, but it's a very different world from thinking theoretically to now I have to be in civil 3D, now I have to be in AutoCAD, now I have to like, think about things in that you know geodetic spatial coordinate geometry system type world and i think it programs people's minds to get into that builder state where they're not only thinking about why am i doing something and what am i going to do and how am i going to do it but where do things go right yeah. where that that x y and z and time component all brought together and i think it really gets us this world of uh, when we talked about this in previous videos, time and space. And I found that, and I'll close with this, if people come from college or the foreman, or, or people go through their career from the foreman level and they go right into superintendent or right into PM, they're missing that, that experience to go think in that visual 3D world. Yeah. They're missing that coordinate system. They're missing that opportunity to use technology and to learn those fundamental skills. And I'll just say this, like as a field engineer reading this book, I was forced to start block lettering and keeping a to-do list and dressing professionally, you know, and having poise 
and all of these fundamentals, I just fear that if we send people out to battle without that training period, we're just going to, it's going to be a loss for us, I yeah. think, in the future. When I think sometimes we hear field engineering and maybe we don't know what it is. Um, like you said, in the dirt world, maybe, maybe not every company has that field engineering position, Correct. but, but <clears throat> the task we do, and even sometimes a field engineering in the civil world could be the grade checker, yeah. right? You yeah. know, uh, or, or survey, some type of survey tech or whatever that, that position or job title might be. Where it's valuable and, and important is I think, I, I often say the best superintendents, best project managers, almost every one of them had a time as a grade checker or yeah. field engineer. It's so hard to look at a set of plans and identify some of the issues if you haven't been out there dealing with them. Correct. You know, example, you were talking about tolerances don't matter as much, and that's true on the dirt side, yeah. just, just the dirt. But most of us um, also, you know, build roads, lay pipe, where all of a sudden now we have tolerances that are quarter inch, much like, yeah. you know, the building world or concrete. And um, one of the ones that I see all the time is uh, parking lot grades having less than a percent of fall. Yeah. And construction tolerancing, tolerances being plus or minus a quarter inch, all of a sudden, if you don't know that, you haven't experienced that in the field, you may not see on the plans that there's a, a flow line that's uh, you know 0.53% and be able to identify, hey, this is an issue, let's get an RFI in. Yeah. So it's definitely probably that, like that real keystone to a successful career is field engineering, grade checking, whatever we call that, but really the guy who, or, or the person who gets to go out and um, use the math in, and use those skills. I agree. You know, when I, and I've mentioned this book in previous videos, I'll just show it here, the construction surveying and layout, you've probably seen this. And w we had had a discussion that some of the topics in here, so like turning 90s, for instance, right? Yep. Maybe you don't do a lot of that because your control networks look different. You might have prisons around the site. You might be directly from GPS. Yeah. But I think to your point, and I do work with civil companies, right? And you know, flow is critical for the you know yeah. the uh, sanitary sewer, right? Yep. It's critical for storm drains, right? It's critical for any of the structures that you're installing, right? Yeah. And then if you're doing like wastewater treatment plants or processing plants or things like that, it is critical. So totally agree. One of the things that, you, that I thought of when you were talking was the focus on quality. Uh, when we and actually I worked with a, a large. Uh, contractor it was a general contractor so yeah. bear with me on that but they were having problems nationally with just rework and you and i know it takes it costs four to twelve times as much to rework something right than to install it right the first time so when we're thinking about the the sanitary sewer line right if it did if we didn't get the compaction right and when we go, uh, what do you call the camera? I can't remember when you. Just say, just say camera. Yeah, when we when we shove the camera down there, <laughs> and we see that the flow isn't right, and you have to go rip it up, and now you have to go rip it up through the base or the lime rock or whatever. or whatever, and come back and do it. It's going to cost at least four to twelve times the amount to go get that done. And so, how can we really create flow on projects like do it right the first time? Yeah. And let me anchor us back to the story I was telling that we found out that surveyors and field engineers and assistant superintendents were assuming that they could install it right the first time. And that's a false premise in the sense that we're human beings. And so we changed their mental paradigm to believe that they couldn't install it right the first time and so if you think about it well what did jason just say what paradigm shift what actions follow that kind of belief and it was if we know that we as humans can't install everything right the first time then we'll all we will always double check it yeah and so if you believe that yeah i can get this 100 percent spot on and you then you won't but if you're like no i'm human then you will check it right and so in this book and in the field engineering world it's double check it with a different person from a different angle a different approach a different technology and we have to have a second set of eyes so if we just run that sanitary sewer line and we're out we're about to backfill it 
Who did the tel- double check on the on the grade? Who did the double check on the slope? Who did the double check on the on the structure location? Yeah. Who did the double check on the invert? Who did the double check on the slope of the parking lot? Right. Yeah. And so I was just to say, what, what's cool about that though is, I think <clears throat> as a, as a contractor, you're like, oh man, but that's more money. That's more time. Obviously, we just said, hey, you could save the potential rework, which is four to twelve times. So probably doesn't cost you more because just just that extra time yeah. probably saves you a lot more expense but i think on top of that what people don't realize that is mentoring yeah. that that yes. is that is training they think like i have to have this elaborate program no you just have somebody else in the trench with you that that's laying pipe that instead of you being the only person who checks it you say all right now i want you to go check this and see what you come up with and either they match you or they don't, but nonetheless, they're practicing a skill and then having teaching opportunities. Yes. So sorry to distract you, but I think no. it's perfect. I think it's, I think it's great. And so there are companies like, there's a book called The Power of Habit. Yep. And in that book, I'm sure you've, you've probably read it, they talk about how having a fanatical focus on quality improves safety, improves cost, improves all of these things. If you can get people to be installing quality work from the get-go, we increase flow and we, create, and we increase safety, right? So to your point, uh, I've seen this where if somebody doesn't spend the time as a rodman, or with your survey department. Anybody anybody out there in the dirt world, you have probably a survey department or or you hire it out, right? Uh, either way, but spending time doing that for a while could be great because the supers that go, or PMs quite frankly, that go college directly in or foreman directly in, the duration of time it takes them to get proficient or to reach their next career step, I don't know if exponential is the right word, but it's it's huge. Yeah. So I've tracked it, and it, I've only tracked it with like nearly like around a hundred people. Like this isn't like a study of like thousands, but field engineering, they it's about six to twelve years that they've hit really high positions, over and over and over. And then if they didn't do the field engineering positions, it's a, it's at least double. Yeah. It's at least double. And so I think your point is great. When I think you know. That, that, that mentality of, hey, uh, foreman to, to this role or, or um, uh, college to project engineer and only handling submittals and then understanding the business side and, and like you said, going up, it's clear when you're in a meeting. Yeah, yeah. It, there, like, I, I can almost, I bet we could probably go to job sites all over America and come out and be like, yeah, di- didn't, didn't do field engineering. Because it gives you that building component yeah. that when you're in a meeting and somebody's like, hey, but, but have we thought about this? Those engineers or those project managers or project engineers who spent time as a field engineer, yeah. I, I feel like they even value the input of subcontractors differently. Yeah. They value the input of the people on the ground because they've seen time and time again that maybe it doesn't make sense necessarily on paper, but that there's something to what they're saying. And so at least they, they hear them out a little bit better. And I was just gonna say, to make it maybe a little bit more revel- revelant, revel- revelant, relevant, relevant, <laughs> relevant. Everybody knew it. <laughs> I, was given, I was given a blooper. You Don't know? cut we, that. We, 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 need a blo- we need a blooper. Uh, to make it more relevant for the dirt world, um, hey, if you haven't been a grade checker, so if you go from operating equipment, maybe you, Maybe you just kill it on the motor grader. And then so you get promoted to foreman superintendent without having time really grade checking. Same thing. I bet you we could see very quickly they stall in their careers or the the time to get to that next level is is longer because there's something about understanding the fundamentals of plans, of quality, of um, the things to be looking for, and then also understanding really what everybody should be doing and and if you haven't spent time pulling slopes um, if you haven't spent time uh, transferring grade from stakes down into a trench uh, all of those things then there's parts of the process you don't understand i agree and the uh, you know i think even if you the if you're on the grading crew right yeah. i'm sure you have lots of supers that came up through the grading crew right yep. they need to spend some time with the pipe crew yeah because there's a lot more shooting elevations and getting things in yeah. alignment, right? Yeah. So I, I think it's such a mistake 
So when companies ask themselves, do I want to bring survey in house or do I want to have a field engineering program? They think, well, who could install, who could actually do the survey work better? Oh, well, we, let's just hire out the risk. Well, first of all, the risk, we always have the risk. Yeah. I, I can't remember ever a time that we sued a survey company for getting something wrong ever. If you have like, correct me if I'm wrong, but like the hiring out the risk, like, okay, whatever. But it's really, do we have a program, a training ground to build future supers yeah. or future PMs, right? That's yeah. the question. We don't, we don't create a field engineering program to do survey. Yeah. We create a field engineering program to build the future. And so, I love companies that are constantly recruiting, hiring, and training, and maybe even have somebody on the bench, God forbid, you know, like yeah. to where they can come take that spot. And last thing I'll say is like, I'm tired of the non proficient, grumpy supers holding our industry hostage because we're like, uh, I need supers. I can't let that person, that guy go. It's always a guy, <laughs> but I can't let that guy go because I need him but he's cancerous and detrimental to the company and doesn't, doesn't make us a ton of money. We're, we're handcuffed, we can't let him go because we don't have this new bench of people that know what they're doing. And for this person that we still love, you know, the superintendent that may not be performing, where's the motivation to get better? We care about him too, right? We have to be developing these people. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about the industry. I think there's definitely, you know, you worked for a national contractor that I respect a lot that does have a really good, hey, you will spend time as a field engineer program. Yeah. Outside of them, I, you know, there's not many people who have a, hey, you will spend time as a field engineer. Even within our own company, it, it kind of seems like you go to field engineering and then you stay there. Yeah. But what an opportunity would be, hey, this is, this is a pathway to leadership so although some may decide they want to stay there, we really need it to have everybody kind of run through this, this cycle, this path. Um, and I think what's great about that is me, if, if we did that, both men and women could gain the experience to really change the quality issues in the industry. And like, it's interesting to me, I, I'm remodeling a house right now, the backyard is being done. And uh, it's maddening just so you know. <laughs> um, but uh, I see just so much rework. Yeah. Like I want to do like a study yeah. uh, and, and I want to figure out how much money are they wasting. Yeah. And so I, we often hear in the construction, well, we need to be more efficient. And a lot of us feel like, man, we have gotten so much more efficient, but we haven't addressed this, this quality issue as well as we could have, I think, yeah. in the industry and, and what that represents. You know, if that costs 12 times as much, in some scenarios, say we have to rework at my house. I feel like they're reworking like something every day, yeah. but let's say it's even 10% rework, yeah. but that costs you four to 12 times as much, or say it's 5% rework, yeah. but that 5% is costing you four to 12 times as much really quickly. We see, we could actually significantly change the industry, make us more competitive by bringing down costs. And I, th yes, I think people hear that and they're like, oh man, I'm, it's, a, it's a threat. No, if what we do is more um, cost competitive, then people will want to do it more, yeah. do it more often. Um, not only that, but the experience itself will be better because yeah. they're not like, we're talking about dirt world, we're talking about big projects, but also the, the guy, the guy or, or man who's, or the man or woman who's paying to have somebody come to their pool, if that was more affordable and they didn't worry, you have to worry about when people are going to show up and you know how how good of quality it was going to be they're going to they're going to do it more often yeah so so i think i think these videos and this is this is just how i talk but like whatever they paid for this course right here like this topic is worth all of it yeah <laughs> like so let's i'd like to spend a little bit of time here so we in my opinion if the whole industry stopped worrying about how fast we're going when we're doing the work and nobody paid attention to it we stopped tracking it we don't care i don't i'm not going to watch it the foreman got it with their foreman if they just completely ignored that 
I don't think we would see at, at any dip in productivity at all. I could just hear people like heresy. Yeah, <laughs> you're, heresy. Being, yeah. you're being stoned right now yeah. through the camera. <laughs> it's the starts and stops. Yeah. It's the in-betweens. When that, when that pipe crew is installing pipe, I don't care if they're going slow or fast. We're probably just hovering right around or a little bit above our bid unit. Don't care. I don't care about it. It's, it's immediately once that structure goes in wrong. It's immediately once we backfill that pipe at the, without slow. It's immediately when we don't have pipe on the site to install. It's immediately right when the general contractor, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> it's immediately when the GC or somebody says, switch from this task to this task. Yeah. It's when we change crew composition. It's when that leader wasn't there lining them out. It's all the in-betweens. Yeah. And so let's use the pools as an example. Real quick though, Go ahead. Uh, before we get into that, I just want to, because otherwise I'll forget this thought. Okay. Go ahead. I think that's why the field engineering role is so cool because you really witness that firsthand. And if you go, hey, I'm out of college and I go to be a project engineer and you don't get to go just be that builder, Yeah. you don't get to see why it's a big deal when somebody asks you to move. Exactly. So exactly. you're like, what does it matter? Yeah. You're installing pipe in the same place. You're installing pipe either way. Why does it matter if it's here or there? Because it does. Yeah. And in, and once you've seen that and you've seen the time, the energy to go set up again, or how hard it is to come back, and then the process of getting control back again, yeah. all of that, then then you get it. And so I think it just kind of echoes. Hey, this time as a field engineer is important. I agree because and this isn't an insult to our project engineer sisters and brothers, but. Yeah. It's an administrative position. Mm -hmm. It's not, again, it's not a builder position. Project engineering, not a builder position. Project manager, not a builder position. Superintendent, not a, you need to be a builder to be a super, but it's not a builder training yeah. position. Yeah. So none of these positions without field engineering or being a, an advanced mm -hmm. foreman are builder positions. And I, I, re, I agree with that 100%. Uh, when, when you take I, I would agree with you 100% as long as they don't get learned hopelessness. Yeah. So let's go to your pull up analogy, if you don't mind, because yeah, it's do really it. exciting. So one piece flow or one process flow, depending on how it's working. The, so in, in uh, Arizona, it, the, everybody I've heard of that are building pools, it takes six to nine months. That's ridiculous. Yeah. How long does it take to build a pool? I bet you we, if you and I did it, we could do it in two to six weeks. Like if, maybe not two, maybe it's three, maybe it's four. I feel confident three to four weeks. Three to four weeks. Okay. I feel confident. Okay. Here's what they're doing. And this is the secret and nobody knows, you know, but nobody else knows. They should work on one at a time and finish it and then go to the next one. So what they're doing is they got a customer. I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to pull. I want to pull. I want to pull. So they go, I'll start yours. I'll start yours. Then move. I'll start yours. I'll start yours. I'll start yours. And so they have all this work in process, right? And what are they doing? They're driving back and forth and missing things and reworking and doing that just to look busy. The only reason they're working on 15 pulls at one time is because the customer wants them to look busy, yeah. which is waste. It's, can I say stupid? Yeah. So it's stupid. <laughs> so if you could get the customers to buy off on it, right? What they need to do is the pool company needs to say, Hey, if I, if I was a pool company, this is what I would say. I'd be like, we are going to build you the best pool at the cheapest cost. And it's going to be the highest quality, but here's how we're going to do it. If you sign up with, I'm going to, I'm a visual person. So I'm going to do this. You can sign up with contractor a, and they're going to start on it next week but they're going to be done in nine months. And if you sign up with us, I've got three pools ahead of you and we're going to start, we're going to, what is uh, what is four? We're going to start right. in three months, but we're going to be done in four months. So you can either be done in nine months or you can be done in four. But the thing is, you're going to be freaked out for the next three months because you're not going to see us. You're not going to see us. We're not going to be there. Uh, but it's really up to you. We're not looking at the start date. We're looking at the end date. So if you hire us, You'll be done in four months. Can we, can we do a different course just on <laughs> teaching that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it, cause it, it's not just in the pool industry, yeah. but it's in, in general. Yeah. I need you here. Like we hear it all the time. And, yeah. I, and my dad was great at this when he was alive. He was really good at helping superintendents understand, hey, I can show up and I'll have two guys there and they're just going to make you happy because they're there. Yeah. But I'm not going to get done any sooner. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and to be honest, you're going to be upset and I'm going to be upset because I'm not making the money I should. And you're going to be upset because you know, what you think should be getting done is not going to be done. Yeah. Or you can give me three days. I'll show up with a full crew and I'll still be done before you need me to be done. Yeah. And by the way, because I'm going to show up with a full crew, these are all the things you need to have done before you get here. Uh, amen. You know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you would reduce rework that way. Oh, too. yeah. Yeah. So your pool contract, did I interrupt? No. Yeah. So your pool contractor, full crew, foreman's in one spot. They focus on the materials. They work through it. They're QCing as they go. They're cohesive. Now you're gonna, we're gonna have to figure out the shot creep, right? Mm -hmm. There are certain bottleneck activities in the, in our pool construction, or like, uh, you know, the decking, right? Yeah. You might have some kind of decorative decking or whatever. But for the most part. We're gonna we're gonna find a way to do one pool at a time. We're gonna install the pool, the waterfall. We're gonna get the electric. So you probably have the shot creek, the electrician, and any decorative paving in your backyard. Those are probably your three bottleneck activities. You're really gonna have to get good at scheduling those. Yeah. But if you're but if you take these customers and you say in three months we're gonna hit you, then you actually get to pre-measure and get all of those things hitting. So we go there, we do the pool, we stay with the customer, we get it right the first time, we do it right, no rework, we get done, we get paid. That's also good for cash flow for business owners, like why are we gonna have all this work in progress and they get paid later? You're, you're, you become a bank, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just go get it done, get paid and move on to the next one. If we could do that, I guarantee you we could cut 40% off of the cost of what it costs to make a pool minimum. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is that nobody knows one piece flow, yeah. one process flow at a time. Yeah. So in our industry, we got to get good at that too, right? And so the other thing is uh, it's all waste. So when they do 12 pools at a time, driving back and forth is waste. The calling is waste. The rework <laughs> is waste. The, I got to go fix that because I didn't double check it. It's waste. The, hey, I'm gonna go supervise this crew, the changing crews, all of its waste and it's taking our production. It, I bet you the production is at a fourth of what it could be. It's so funny because well, I know my wife probably gets tired of hearing it, but I, I'm watching it and it's just, it's like maddening for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like for example, uh, they'll, they'll show up and then somebody leaves to get material. Yeah. I'm like, like, why didn't you get material on the way or yesterday or the day was over? Why, why are you waiting happen? till everybody gets here and then people just sit around while you're getting material? Um, so I think it just kind of all helps reiterate the point that that field engineering position yeah. really gives you the foundation yeah. to become a manager at, yeah. at some level in the business. I think this is an overview of the field engineering position. Is there anything else we want to try and just hit as kind of the overview? before we before we stop absolutely but one thing we should start a pool company <laughs> yeah. and so we're going to do one pool at a time we just get the marketing in line and we're going to make it time right. right i think bill can <laughs> help us with that <laughs> so we 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 need to we need to go because <laughs> those are those are the production uh principles and for from a field engineering standpoint the let's go back to the rework just the rework alone would save at least that 40% that we're talking about because yeah. we're there and we don't change context. Yeah. So from a quality standpoint, the rework, this is what I was going to say before, and then I'll, I'd like to cover something here before yeah. we go on for the field engineering Perfect. is that the bot, and I said this on previous videos, the bottom 25% of workers, the average production that they get when they're working is higher than your bid units, meaning they do better than what you would bid. And you're like, mm, I don't know if I believe that, Jason. Now, let me keep going. The top 45% or 25% are four times as productive as the bottom 25% of your workers when they're in work, when they're flowing. So then you're like, well, why are we losing money, right? In the industry, not you. It's because of the, the starts and the stops. Yeah. So Nicholas Modig, I mentioned his book yesterday. This is Lean. It's a great book. I have it in my briefcase. Uh, he talks about there's three things that cost us money. Restarts, which is rework, right? Uh, having too much work in process. That goes back to our pool analogy, right? And having unevenness, meaning that we have uh, overburden or we have variation in the system, right? And we overproduce which causes the other eight wastes. 
and we, and we, we, we could go over that later, but you know, if you overproduce something, you have an excess inventory of it, it has to be moved, transported, and then there are defects, which causes over-processing, which causes waiting. Those other wastes are caused when we overproduce. So if yeah. we have starts and stops, which, we overproduce and we have unevenness, that's all, those are where we're losing money. Which overproduction, a lot of companies are probably thinking, that doesn't happen, but just think about ordering materials. Yeah. How often do you order more than you need? Yeah. And then think about the time and money spent trying to get it restocked, yeah. getting it thrown away, whatever, right? That's, that's that kind of over produce is potentially we're just getting more material. I mean, and a perfect example, if you're a highway guy, if you get too much ABC out there on your project or, your, or road base, whatever the, what your, your market calls it, and next thing you know, you have to backhaul 2,000 tons. Yeah. <laughs> That's an expensive process. Agreed. Or if you're doing a five mile road and you went and graded that, that whole thing and you have a hellacious storm, and now you've got to go regrade it or you've done 15 pads instead of the three that you need at a time and it rains and people have trashed it now you've got to go refine grade all yeah. of them or subgrade all of them or 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 like overproducing something outside of that flow is yeah. is so detrimental so going back to that is that you know we we really have to to do things right the first time because when crews are producing, and I'm not wrong about this, when crews are producing without the restarts, without the overproduction, without the variation, they're doing better than your bid units, even if you just left them alone. Let's get work installed the right the first time. And so when I'm talking about pipe crews, if you're installing structures, you're in the mine, you're looking at curb and gutter, you're looking at slopes on parking lots, even if you're a grading crew, this book, I'll just reference it, uh, there are some key things that we have to know how to do, right? The, even the fundamental double checks, three, four, fives, distance measurement, we have to know those basics. Angle measurement, we have to know those basics, at least from a slope standpoint. Total station use, maybe not when we're using the robotics and GPS, but especially chapter seven here, leveling. How do you do differential leveling? How do you do profile leveling? How do you do grid leveling? on a site? How do you do your, your topographic surveys? How do you interag interact with an ag tech map? How do you uh, do a level loop to make sure that your benchmarks are correct from the first point? How do you use lasers, GPS fundamentals? These what? things, even going back to your, I mean, even to start your site, you need a good primary control network, yeah. you need a good secondary control network, and then your GPS equipment and your robotic tool stations will then localize and you'll be able to use them on site. But these fundamentals from a field engineering standpoint are just crucial and it's the key to us getting things right the first time. So, And, and I think that sometimes we're like, well, it, we can kind of just pigeonhole to, well, that's for layout, that's for that's for installing, but it's so much more. Yeah. I was on, we were on a project, we were doing an earthen dam, we were moving lots of dirt. And one of the things that on a consistent basis, we'd show up and, and we'd review quantities. Yeah. Hey, how are we doing on production? Yeah. Um, where are we at quantity wise? And there's just always this variation. And I'm like, all right guys, what we're doing is pretty simple. Where are we getting these quantities? Why, why is it that every month we have a quantity true up with survey in it and we're off so much? What's going on? Oh, we're using load count. Okay, so the guys are counting <laughs> exactly. loads and this happens all the time. This, yeah. is, this is like probably one of the industry standards is load counts for moving dirt. I'm like, guys, I appreciate that, but that's just, that's just one point of yeah, data. Yeah. We're, we're cutting a channel. Yeah. How hard is it at the beginning of the day to mark where we're at in the channel, to will off where we got to, and do some simple math? Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. And, and double check, hey, are we close on load counts? Exactly, just, <laughs> just doing simple math. Just right there, I agree. Yeah. And, and these so, can't be forgotten, no. right? Yeah, and, and it's like, oh, well, we need to have survey come out with a GPS and topo the area and all that's great. And there's, if, if the project allows for it, then awesome. But don't be hamstringed by the fact that you can't do some simple math because the reality is I still feel pretty confident that I can go out and do yes. a pretty rough takeoff with a tape measure, an eye level, and some math. Yeah, I totally and, and, and agree. And that shouldn't be lost. I totally agree. And if you think about it, like, 
we probably are not going to sustain an EMP attack or something, but will there be a day where our industry has forgotten these fundamentals and like what's go what are the unintended consequences of that? So I, I just feel like here's my closing advice from my, my standpoint to everyone out there on the cameras that, you, you know, we, if you want to build the best project managers and supers, then you need to have a field engineering program. And we not only focus on what we're going to build, but we focus on who we're going to build. We build people that build things. We build people that build things. And the question that I have, as you're building the structure that is a human being, right? Do they have that? Did they get a chance with lift drawings? Did they get a chance with civil 3D? Did they get a chance with the automatic level? Did they get a chance with the robotic? Did they get a chance to pull tape? Did they get a chance to do a three, four, five and pull 90? Did they get a chance with these formulas? Did they get a chance to, like you said, work with the foreman out in the field and experience that? Did they get a chance to go install components and measure and be responsible for not just how we're doing something, but the actual location, the builder aspects. And I would just say, if we haven't filled these folks up with good experience, that's going to hurt them later on, which will then hurt what we're doing in the field. And I just, I have never seen a company spend time and have a good field engineering program and financially suffer from it. I've seen people dispatch people. Oh, I'll close with this. There's a military term called hobbling the workforce. I don't know if you've probably heard of it, but I got that from Sun Tzu's The Art of War and then another book, The 33 Strategies of War, which I think is fantastic. And it's a term in ancient military uh, custom and tradition and teaching, hobbling the workforce is when the general would dispatch people into impossible situations. Go take that hill or go do this or whatever. When it just wasn't a winnable battle, it's called hobbling the workforce. There wasn't any strategy, there wasn't thought, there wasn't preparation. And when we send project engineers and PMs and supers out into projects and they haven't been trained as builders, we are hobbling them. We are hobbling our army. We are hobbling the workforce because we're sending them into impossible situations without that training, right? And the problem is, is or the opportunity is, we know how to do it. So let's go do what you said and take the time because even if we go slower doing it the first time, it's going to be four, six, eight, twelve 12 times better than installing it fast the wrong way and having to rework it. Yeah. I don't know that I have much to add to that. Uh, just, just act on what he said. Let's, let's get a field engineering program in your company. Let's improve it. Let's really work to uh, better the workforce and increase the flow, uh, increase our quality. And I think the industry will be better for it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.